That's me. <laughs> so good. Feel free to take a seat, everybody. Welcome. And why don't we thank the worship team? Such a great job. That was wonderful. What a great time it is, Easter. And um, some people say, what's so good about Easter? Why do they call it Good Friday? Have you ever thought about that? Why do we call today Good Friday? So we're going to be talking about that, but I just, uh, from the onset, I wanted to say a welcome to everybody, and uh, welcome to the new people here, and the family and friends who've come to join us. On a Friday morning, good on you guys for getting up and uh, to celebrate what God is doing in your life because he's sacrificed so much, but good on you for making that sacrifice to be here uh, today. It doesn't go lightly and uh, God definitely sees your heart and he sees your actions and he knows, um, you know, he knows what you're going through and he's here to support you. But I wanted to encourage us today with the message of the good news. Because Jesus' love, it covers all things. And uh, many people will ask us the question, why do they call it Good Friday? Because there doesn't seem to be much good about it, right? For a man to be hung on a cross, it's one of the most horrific deaths that someone can experience. What's so good about that? What is so good about somebody being punished and ridiculed by people. What's so good about that? What is, what is so good about the world right now? What is so good about what is taking place right now in the world? Have you ever thought about asking yourself that question? What's so good about what is happening right now in the world? With all the chaos, all the calamity, we had COVID-19. What is good about the world? Well, when I was growing up, I was in a season in my life where I didn't seem, it didn't seem like things were going good. There was some unfinished business. And so some of you here would know, but when I was young, I had something pretty tragic that happened, took place in my life, where my father, he passed away when I was quite young. And it was not good. But after he passed away, the thing that was really not good was the fact that I found that I still hadn't forgiven him for some of the things that he had done to me. And I held on to that anger or that bitterness or that resentment or that unforgiveness. There was certainly unfinished business in my life and in my heart, and it did not seem good. What is good? Why do we call it Good Friday? Why is there so much unfinished business in our lives, in this world? I mean, we spend our life blaming others for not being good because deep down inside, we know that we also are not good. If we were to take a proper assessment upon our own life, in our own heart, we would realise very quickly that we are not good. And we go through this wrestle in life, we go through this struggle in life, don't we? Where it's like, how can I make up for not being good? There's certain things in our heart. There's sins. There's thoughts that enter our mind. There's behaviors that we display. There are things that we've done with our actions that have hurt people, words that have scarred people. And we realize deep inside, every single one of us have realized that there's something not so good on the inside of each of us. And all we try to do is make up for what's not good on the inside of us. So A, we can either try blaming other people around us, because for as long as other people aren't good, then we are normal. So if we can make sure that we can try to convince ourselves that everybody else isn't good, then maybe that makes us feel a bit normal about ourselves, because ultimately each and every one of us want to accept ourselves, and that's the battle of humanity to actually deeply accept ourselves. Because Jesus Christ says that you need to be able to love your neighbor as you love yourself. How can you love your neighbor if you do not love yourself? And so there is this deep self-acceptance that Jesus is requiring us to go on a journey and a process with. 
Do you accept the person that I have created? Do you accept the person that stares at you when you look in the mirror? Is there a a, a deep self-acceptance or is there a shame? Or is there a self-rejection? Or is there a self-hatred? And these are some of the mountains that we need to conquer because ultimately we all realize that there is something that is not good on the inside of each of us. And I've had moments in my personal life where I'm like, there are certain things in my life that are not good. And so you know what I used to do? I used to try and do more good things so that I, that I could make it up to God and to, and to make him love me more. So I'd start to do good things, char- charitable deeds, good things to serve other people. I'd start to serve more at church, only to realize that all of my good deeds could never earn his grace. And I realized that his grace was freely already given to me. But what what do we do when we don't know what to do, when we realize that something in us is not good? Isaiah 64 verse 6 says this, All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We are all shriveled up like a leaf, and like the wind our sins sweep us away. Something right there gives us a picture that things are not good. And it's even saying that even on our best day, we're so still far from hitting perfection. So what used to happen back in the day before Jesus Christ came into the picture onto planet Earth, what used to happen was that the Israelites, they used to have to perform a ritual to cleanse themselves, to become right with God. And they use this word atonement. And we'll have a look at this word atonement and what the meaning of atonement is. So it's found in the Leviticus chapter 1, verse 3 to 4. And it goes on to say this. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, you are to offer a male without defect. So it's got to be perfect. You must present it at the entrance to the tent of meeting so that it will be acceptable to the Lord. You are to lay your hand on the head of the burnt offering and it will be accepted on your behalf to make atonement for you. So what used to happen is if you had sin in your life, you would need to go to the altar, you would need to get one of your herd and you would need to sacrifice that herd on the altar and it needs to, do, to be without defects, a perfect, a perfect species, without defect. Think about the time that's involved in choosing, allocating, ensuring that this was perfect. This was a perfect animal. And then after you've gone through that rigorous process, then presenting it to the altar and performing a ritual that took hours. Every time you made a mistake, every time you committed a sin, every time... You did something that was displeasing to the heart of God. You would need to do this on behalf of yourself and your family. Think about the process. Think about the time. Think about the difficulty. Think about the struggle in this, that our sins have separated us from God. And in order to be atoned by God, we would need to perform this ritual. What does atonement mean? Atonement simply means to be at one with the Father. And we all have a desire to be at one with the Father, to be at peace with God, to have a sense of his presence in our life. You know, some some of us just need to know that God is with us. God, are you actually with me? God, actually, uh, do you care about me? Atonement means that you have a oneness with the Father, that you know that he is with you, that you know that he is for you, that you know that he will never walk away from you to have atonement in your life. And God's will is for each and every every one of us to have atonement. So you would bring your very best to the altar. You would go through a tedious process and would have to do it over and over and over and over and over again. And that's what we go through as human beings. We make a mistake and we try to make up for it. 
and we go through a tedious and rigorous process of trying to make up for the mistakes that we've made. And we walk with a sense of shame and guilt and we condemn ourselves and we tell ourselves that, you know what, you're not worth anything. There is no worth on your life. And we do this over and over and over and over and over again until it crushes us. But then what happened? God sent Jesus Christ to planet Earth. God sent his only begotten son. Could you imagine sending your own child as a sacrifice for humanity? Could you imagine letting go of everything that you love, everything that you know, your whole world, and letting, letting it be crushed before you as you watch? In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10 to 14, it says this, And by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ, once and for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. On this day, the entire sacrificial system stopped. So when Jesus Christ once and for all made that one sacrifice for all of sins that could only, it was the only thing that could take away sins, the sacrificial system had stopped because Jesus Christ chose to be, to become the sacrifice himself. And the Bible simply states that Yes, we feel that we are not good. Yes, we know that we are not good. But now since Jesus Christ has come, he has laid his life down for you and for me. Now the Bible is saying you are good. Now you are good. But how can this be, God? Because I've got imperfection in my life. No, God is saying, you and I are now good. And even as Christians or even as believers or even as people who believe in Jesus Christ to be the way, the truth and the life, we still go through a sacrificial system in our mind, in our psyche. We go through a rigorous and tedious process of shame and guilt and things are not finished in our lives. We still have un finished business, don't we? Just like I had unfinished bus business of unforgiveness in my life. We have unfinished business. But God is saying, it is good and you are good. Because when Jesus Christ hung on the cross, his final sentence was, it is finished. It is finished. This toiling, this wrestling, this struggling, now since Jesus made the one sacrifice for all time, for all sins, it is finished. I'm going to ask David Mangeli if he can come up and just play in the background. But Jesus Christ is saying that the wrestle and the fight and the struggle is now finished. And while we still carry unfinished business, while we'll still continue to live our life, God is echoing his grace and his love toward us and he's saying, you don't have to wrestle anymore. You don't have to fight anymore. You don't have to continue to toil and go through a tedious and rigorous process anymore. You don't have to do enough good in order to earn my love. It is finished. It is good. 
and you now are good. All you need to do is receive. Receive God's love. Walk in His grace. Receive His grace. We don't have to fight. There is nothing we can do to earn it. There is nothing good we can do to earn God's love. There is nothing we can do to make God love us more. There is nothing that we can do that makes us worthy enough to receive His grace. But it is what Jesus did on the cross. But there's a challenge that's been given out. Jesus is saying, is it really finished? It is finished. I've done my part. I've done everything I could. I've given up my life on the cross. I've sacrificed everything. I died so that you could live. While I was on earth, walking with you, I told you about peace. I told you to love your enemies. While everybody else was preaching about rules and religion and rigorous processes and tedious tra traditions, I brought grace and I brought love and I preached a different message. I preached about peace and joy. I preached about love. Self-acceptance is a big part of the gospel, but you will never have peace with yourself unless you finish business. And so I found myself, six years after my father had passed away, crying, weeping, because I still hadn't been able to deal with this unforgiveness in my own heart. And there was unfinished business. And there was a moment where God, He used a man who pointed this out in my life. He said, maybe you still struggle with unforgiveness. And I could clearly see what that is. But I needed a man to point that out. I needed someone to point that out. But I'm telling you, the Son of Man is here. Jesus Christ, our Saviour and our Lord, is here. He is present with us right now. And He gently reminds us of the unfinished business. And He offers us an opportunity to lay it back down at the foot of the cross and say, Jesus, today I finish this. I choose to call this thing finished business. What's the unfinished business in our life? What is the thing that is going to cause us to go from the old to the new, from death to life, from sin to made whole? What is that thing that is separating you? Is it hate? Is it control? Is it lust? Is it jealousy? Is it anger? Is it shame? Is it fear? Is it anxiety? Is it guilt? Is it hurt? What is unfinished in our heart? What is the unfinished business? And I found myself weeping and coming before the Lord and, and someone pointed it out. And I realized that there was unfinished business in my life. And on that night, I got on my knees and I said, Lord, tonight I declare this issue as finished business, as you declared on the cross, that these issues are now finished. Jesus Christ once and for all died to finish business in our life so that we could come to a place where we could receive His grace, His love, His acceptance. But now it's our opportunity to accept ourselves and to receive His grace and His love. So what we have right now is each and every one of us has a piece of paper under our chair and each and every one of us has a pencil next to that paper. And what we're going to do in this time is we're going to set aside a little bit of time to make unfinished business finished. Right at the cross, at the foot of the cross, this is powerful. There is a bowl. Is there anything special about that bowl? No. Is there, is there like a hand that's going to come out of that bowl and grab that piece of paper and get rid of it? No. No. But there's something powerful that happens in our hearts as we take a step of faith and declare that something is finished once and for all. That that one sacrifice for all time, for all people, 
has caused this to be finished business. Now, I don't know what it is that is unfinished in your life. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's some pain or hurt. But what I'm going to ask is for each of us to write that unfinished business that is separating us from receiving the love and the grace of God that He has for us, laying it at the foot of the cross and saying, this is finished. So in the next five minutes, David is going to play a song, an item. And as he's playing that item, feel free to write that on the piece of paper and just lay it down at the foot of the cross. Was 
shed for me. There's no greater love than this. You have overcome the grave. Glory fills the highest place. What can separate me now? At the cross above my knee, where your blood was shed for me. God looks at you and says, you were good. It is good because it is finished. It's been finished on the cross for us for all time. And now is the time where we receive God's love. And I'm going to pray for each, every, each and every person. And if you can just close your eyes, that would be great. Father God, thank you that this is the moment where we stop toiling we stop struggling, we stop striving, and we rest in your presence. And we accept the fact that you sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross, your begotten Son, to die once and for all, one sacrifice for all sins, for all time, for all people. We receive this forgiveness, we receive this love in our heart, and we choose to believe that we are good only because you are good. You can open up your eyes now. That's why they call it Good Friday. Because what he did was good. That's why we call it Good Friday. Because it is good. It is good what he has done. It is good what he has done in our hearts. And it is good that now we are made good. The Bible even goes as far to say that he has made us righteous in his sight. That when he looks at us, he sees the love of God on us. He sees the forgiveness of Jesus Christ on us. And that's how he sees us. He chooses to look at us for our weaknesses. And he chooses to see us for our potential and what we are becoming rather than who we were. God loves us. And this is a question for all of us. Are you good? Are you right with God? Have you received His love? Have you received His grace? Have you received the truth? Because the Bible says that the truth will set you free and the truth is that Jesus Christ came to die for our sins, to set us free. And He brought the only message that brings salvation and it's been wrought through the cross of Jesus Christ at Calvary. The only way you can go into eternity with the loving Father is if you receive Christ in your heart and choose to make Him your personal Lord and Saviour. So today, my challenge to you is, have you made Jesus Christ your personal Saviour? Or maybe you have, and for some reason you've walked away. And God, through His kindness and through His love, is drawing you back to a place 
of oneness, of atonement with Him, where you can walk with the Father, where there is peace. Just for privacy, I'm going to ask everybody to close their eyes once again. And if you are here and you've never received eternal life, life after death, in paradise, through believing in Jesus Christ, this is your moment. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow, but today. Now is the time of salvation. Today is the day. This is the hour of His favour. Now is the time. What a wonderful opportunity for you to receive Jesus Christ in your heart. And there's some of you here today where you feel there's something in your heart that is stirring you towards receiving Christ. There is something in your heart that is telling you that God's presence is here. And I'm just going to ask while the eyes are closed, if you want to say yes to Jesus Christ, if you want to say yes to the one that said yes to you, if you want to say yes to the one that laid his life down for you so that you can have life and life to the, all its fullness, if you want to say yes to heaven, if you want to say yes to eternal life in peace and paradise, if you want to say yes, then you say yes to Jesus. And now is the time. Now is the time to make a decision, not tomorrow, but now. Today is the day. With eyes closed, I'm going to ask for those who want to say yes to Jesus, either for the first time or making a recommitment to Him. I'm going to ask on the count of three if you could slip up your hand to make that decision. One, God loves you. Two, He's got a purpose and a plan for you. Three, if that's you, why don't you just slip up your hand if that's you. You want to say, yes, I receive Christ. Awesome. Into my heart. Awesome. I receive His love. And I say, yes. I say, yes to Jesus. So good. Amazing. I say, yes to who He is. I say yes to following Him in the plan and purpose that He has over my life. I say yes to Jesus who said yes to me. So good, so good, so good. I'm going to pray a prayer and after that prayer, I want you to repeat the prayer. Everyone to repeat this after me. Dear Jesus, come on, you can do better than that. Dear Jesus, thank you for what you have done for me. Thank you that it is finished. No more fighting. No more striving. No more pushing. Just receiving. Receiving your love. Receiving your grace. And receiving your truth. I choose to follow you, Jesus. Now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's give God a hand for that. The people that made a decision today. It is wonderful. So great. And with that said, just remember throughout this week, it is good. Today is Good Friday. And I pray, Lucy and I pray that you have a wonderful day. You have a great time with people that care for you. Uh, surround yourself with people that value you, that speak life over you. But just remember that you are good. Why? Not because of what you've done, but because of what He's done as you receive His love for your life. Let's give God one more hand today. His goodness, His grace. It's so wonderful. And this Sunday, we have a very special Easter Sunday service at 4 p.m., and we just wanted to invite everyone um, back to that and invite your friends, invite your family. Because it's going to be an incredible service, very powerful and very meaningful. And I just believe that hearts will be changed and transformed and God will be doing something absolutely incredible. So it'll be great to see you on Sunday at 4 p.m. for our Easter Sunday service. But once again, have a really, really good day. And guess what, kiddies? Are you still in the building, children? There is. You've been. Why don't we give a hand to the kids? They've been. I haven't heard one child the whole time. Man.
not just the kids, but you know, the parents as well, because the way you've raised them is exceptional. Not even the babies are crying today. What's going on? It's great. But you know what? <laughs> now, first time. Go, Hugo. Hey, we have an Easter egg hunt. How exciting.